Right, we're going to pick up the story where we left it the last day. So we had covered a little bit of the longer history in the philosophy of mind, looking at the ways that people have approached the how we come by knowledge and what knowledge is. We've identified these empiricist and rationalist concerns, empiricists focusing very much on the role of the senses and experience in how we come about knowledge, rationalists fo focusing instead very much on uh, innate properties of reason, which we're assumed to be born with, um, focusing on certain knowledge grounded in reason. And then we switched to the much younger history of the science of psychology, which originated in the second half of the 19th century. Um, we saw that um, this time was characterized by huge change in the sciences. We had massive changes in physics with electromagnetism and the theory of the atom and chemistry, the periodic table. In biology, we had the origin of species and the theory of evolution. So this meant, on the one hand, that science was paying big dividends into people's lives. It was changing their lives, radically transforming their lives in many ways. Not all of them good, but radically transforming them. And with the biological theory of evolution, it also gave people a means of viewing themselves as continuous with other life forms, as part of the big web of nature, as opposed to God created and distinct from the rest of nature. So this made a huge difference. So that the scientific method was really paying off, and it began, of course, to be turned to human concerns and to our lives. And it wasn't clear what aspect of our lives a, a science of psychology would be responsible for. And there were sort of twin tracks here. On the one hand, people wanted to understand why humans act as they do, why we behave in the way that we do. So psychology aspired to being a science of behavior. But we also met the, um, this chap, William James, who was very clear that psychology has also to be a science of experience. That is a science that addresses the notion of consciousness, feeling, perception, that which is subjective in many respects. Um, he gave us the term the stream of consciousness, which as we saw didn't transform science, nice and all as it is, but it did hugely affect subsequent literary descriptions of people in that thereafter novelists started to try to get inside the characters' heads and to describe the inner workings of their mind in some sense. That's where we left it the last day. William James, as well as writing the first psychological textbook, The Principles of Psychology, he wrote another one which was called The Varieties of Religious Experience. And he was well aware that when you turn your attention to consciousness or lived experience, that there was a lot of expertise in traditions that were quite remote from his own more or less Christian background. Uh, so he was influenced by Buddhist and Hindu philosophy as well as Western science. And this turns out to be of relevance to contemporary cognitive science as well, which is seeking in many respects to broaden its horizons. William James belonged to a school of American philosophy known as pragmatism. Um, the characteristic of this school was that they weren't really seeking to find out what's, what the truth is, the ultimate truth. They instead wanted to find out how we could live our lives better, how we could improve things. Um, so they, they were interested more in the cash value of a proposition rather than its truth status. Um, and with that, because he was one of the founders of psychology, he also started a tradition which lives on very much in today's psychology, not entirely in the scientific vein, but this is the notion of self-help, that psychological theories should be uh, in some ways comforting, consoling, they should provide you with guidance as to how you should live, None of these are scientific ideas, really, and psychology has this weird nature of being both inside and, in some, to some extent, outside psychology. If you go and buy, there are popular psychological magazines that are full of nothing but this kind of self-help, and it really annoys me somewhat that if RTE interviews a psychologist on the radio, a psychologist always has to talk in a breathy voice like this. If you interview a chemist, you don't expect the chemist to talk in a particular voice, but psychologists always have to have this kind of mammy nature to them. That's an odd basis for a science. Um, we noted that there was an awful lot of 
different approaches taken to ground this early science of the, the beginnings of the science of psychology. One thing people did, as they had always done, is they reasoned from armchairs. So they decided that things must be so simply by bringing the massive power of their no doubt bearded intellect to bear on the issue. That's more or less philosophy as we know it. But it also became an experimental science. We had a lot of behavioral experiments, and to this day, creativity knows no bounds. The psychologists are very much engaged in the task of devising um, interesting, constrained experiments that get people, set people tasks and observing their responses. There's no limit to the variety of things that one can do there. One particularly popular approach in these early days was uh, to study people who were in a state of hypnosis, or as it was called then, mesmerism. This was not only the stuff of stage magicians and entertainment parlors, but it was also a means to study an altered state of consciousness. And hypnosis remains to this day a somewhat fringe topic within psychology, but very much one that's still studied. Um, we're going to look, though, at these two in a little detail. Psychophysics has a great name, doesn't it? Like psycho killer. Um, and we originally we started off this whole course pointing out that the physic physics is not some kind of simple stuff that's there in opposition to the mental. Um, but physics is very concerned with measurement, and it's a an endeavor with a lot of history, a lot more history than the science of psychology. So we kind of we're on safe scientific ground when we're doing physics, but what's that psycho bit doing in there? Well, we'll have a good look at that now in just a second. And finally, introspection is something we'll come back to. That's more or less trying to look inside inside your own mind to find out what's going on. Psychophysics is fun, but I don't know what it's about. But it has persisted. It had its origins back in these very very early days in the 1870s, 1880s. And to this day, lots of people are engaged in this kind of uh, attempt to marry the domains of psychology and physics. What would that mean? Well, physics, I'm going to use physical here to mean things we know how to measure. Okay, this is uh, not a very good definition of physics, but certainly measurement is at the heart of physics. And part of the reason physics has been so successful is because it's really brilliant at measuring stuff. And the measurements are uh, they establish a kind of objective fact in a way that mere opinion doesn't. If we have a means of measuring the length of a table, then it doesn't really matter what my beliefs are. If you conduct the measurements using the same instruments and the same procedures, you'll end up with the same numbers. So that's what physics is all about. It's, it's the, this kind of vanishing of doubt by establishing measurement principles. Now, we can measure things, but what we can't measure is what you experience, what you hear, what you see, what you feel. In order to get at that, we have to ask you things. We can ask you, did you hear that? We can ask you, how do these tones compare? And we're going to have a little demonstration of this now in the auditory or the domain of sound, um, where we're going to compare what you hear with what we can measure. Now, sound is, in, in some sense, it's vibration in the air. And we can measure how rapid those vibrations are. Uh, so if we have a sound which is 100 hertz, that means the air molecules are vibrating 100 times a second. And that sounds a bit like this. Fairly low pitched, uh, a bit quiet. First thing to ascertain is, can you hear that? I think the answer is yes, even though it's not, not a very good representation of the sound here. Um, now suppose when we change the frequency of the sound, we can ask, well, how did your perception change? <laughs> Right, that's twice the frequency. Again, that's in the physics domain. We can measure the frequency. Twice the frequency. Was that sound the same as the first one? No. How would you describe its relation to the first one? Hmm? Higher, higher pitched. Pitch is the, the, is the subjective business of saying something is higher or lower. It's different from frequency, which we can measure, but they bear a relation. And now we can explore that relation. The musicians among you might have noticed that the second town was an octave higher than the first. In some sense, that's about that's a particular distance. You know, if you're on a piano, you can go from a note C, a low C, to a middle C, to a high C. Each time you're, you're moving an octave. And going from 100 hertz to 200 hertz gave us a tone which was similar to the first, but higher. If we go up another 100 hertz, 
That's 300 hertz, and that is not an octave higher than the first. I'll play you those, because you weren't paying attention to that, um, in that way. I'll play you the 100, 200. Can you hear that they're kind of the same tone, just higher? That's not the same tone, but this one is. So we went to 400. So 100, 200, and 400 are similar, but 300 is a bit different. Hmm. Now we can play these to a lot of people. Um, what we find is that basically every time we double the frequency, we go up one octave. So if you think of sound as being laid out on the piano, we move a fixed distance by doubling the frequency. So 800 should be the same tone, just higher still. And 1600, I'll turn it down a bit. Okay, so that's, you can hear that going up one octave at a time, but in each case, doubling the frequency. Now, we can measure the frequency, we can ask you about the, what you hear, and in this way we can find a relationship between the physical measurement and your perception. And we can plot this. Here's a plot of the two, the two things we have there. This is the measurement we can make, the frequency, and this is your report, and it's using a different scale, one that psychophysicists have established. But you can see that the relationship is not a simple straight line relationship. It's not a, a what we call a linear relationship. It's more complex than that, even in this domain of frequency versus pitch. Um, you can establish this using the kind of tones we just did and playing them to people and trying to find out whether two things sound the same or different. We can find out what's the just noticeable difference, for example, which will vary as we go up. Um, we can allow people to adjust tones until one seems to be twice as high as the other, for example. We can give people lots of different tasks in order to establish this relationship between something we can measure, that's quite familiar scientific ground, and something people report on, I don't know what that's about, but it's really interesting. And so that's the psychophysical relationship. And we've just illustrated it using sound, using the relationship between frequency, which is measurable, and pitch which is something you perceive. Staying in the domain of sound, we could, we could likewise have looked at the relationship between amplitude or intensity of the sound. That's how much energy is in it. We can measure that. And we can ask you about loudness. And what we would find is there's a complicated relationship here between how loud a sound appears to you and how intense the energy in the sound is. Um, there's no instrument in the world that can measure loudness. Everything over here is something we have to ask people about. That's the only way to get at it. Because these words describe things that are subjective, that refer to your perception. These words describe things we can measure. Moving to the domain of seeing and vision, we can measure luminosity. It used to be measured in candle power, now it's measured in lumens. And we can ask you about brightness. You can say, yeah, that light seems to be twice as bright as this light for example, to establish a relationship between what we can measure and what you perceive. And once we start playing this game, we can get really funky with it. We don't have to stick to these very simple things. If any of you have gone on a wine tasting course, for example, you've learned to describe your perception of the wine in terms of <laughs> notes of tannin and cherry with a lingering palate and a fresh nose. If any of you taking wine tasting courses, this is the kind of nonsense that they spark. So you can do tests and see. Well, we can measure the chemical composition of the wine. How does that relate to the words that you, that you use? You'll find the relationship to be much less stable than we just observed between frequency and pitch. But we can do the same game. There's no limits on how complicated the thing is. If we can measure it and we can ask you about it, then we can do psychophysics. In the domain of touch, for example, we can measure how hard something presses and we can ask you, did that hurt? Is this twice as much as that? Those kinds of things. So that's the domain of psychophysics. It's kind of a weird business because we're sort of we're, we're, we're comfortable doing science over here. We're far less comfortable over here, but the psychologist's job is to figure out what people perceive, how the world appears to people, how they experience the world. So this is really important as well. It looks like a mapping between the physical and the mental, but that's a very dangerous way of thinking about it. Remember. Descartes, who decided that the world came in two different varieties, there's the physical stuff and the mental stuff, nobody believes that. That's not our metaphysics. We don't 
believe that, and yet this looks a lot like it. So there's a kind of a weird thing going on. But it's not as weird as introspection. Introspection, if I give you a task, I say, let's say, I say, okay, rem remember your holiday last summer. How did you do that? You go, I don't know, I just kind of remembered it. Hmm. It's very hard to say how you do something. How did you come up with that poem? How did you solve that problem? I don't know, I just kind of did. Well, we could establish protocols, have very standardized ways of asking people how they did things, and we could compare their reports. And this was one of the principal means used in the early days of psychology in Wilhelm Wundt's lab in Leipzig, among other places. And it turns out that the way you ask a question, surprise, surprise, hugely influences the answer you get. The experimenter who's doing the job hugely influences the answers we're going to get. You don't want that in your science. If you do the same experiment in two different labs with different subjects, you get completely different results. So introspection turns out to be lousy. It's not a good way. We don't have access to, I don't even know what we would want access to, to our inner workings. Do you have access to the inner workings of your liver? Probably not. Do you have access to the inner workings of your brain? No more than your liver, I suggest. But so introspection was not producing uh, stable results. And it kind of got the nascent science of psychology a bad name, with the result that a group of, a, a sort of a, a school of psychology arose primarily in, um, in, in America, with also strong components in Britain, not so much in continental Europe, which was known as behaviorism. These were going to outscience the science guys. They like to wear white coats, and they like to emphasize their scientific credentials that they can measure stuff. Okay, and they didn't like talking about un what you can't observe, things like perceptions and feelings and emotions and, and beliefs and desires and so on. They were trying to be really sciencey, rigorous. You know, unfortunately, there's more to being really sciencey than putting on a white coat. And behaviorism came in very many forms. Uh, B.F. Skinner here is probably the most famous one. We'll meet one other famous one called uh, Ivan Pavlov, who you may have heard of. And the basic move of behaviorism is this. We're faced with a whole bunch of really difficult questions about the relationships between minds, brains, and behavior, or minds, bodies, and behavior, I don't know. And so they simply said, well, let's get rid of that one. That's causing us all kinds of problems. Let's look at, the, let's look at behavior alone and consider it in relation to, I don't know, brains, or bodies, or context, or all kinds of different things. Now, if your emphasis is on behavior, we started this course pointing out that behavior is, <laughs> you know, it's not simple. The flow of movement in the world doesn't come partitioned and labeled into this behavior or that behavior. And when you observe a behavior, you've kind of become implicated yourself in the description. Scientists are good at this, though, so if you create standardized conditions and you observe the same thing again and again, we can call that a behavior. We can make it that which we see under these conditions. So one way of doing that is to work a lot with animals. Uh, these guys' behaviors primarily worked with animals, not with humans. And they were very, very interested in um, how we acquire behaviors, how we come to move and do one thing rather than another. What is it that changes us so that we now exhibit a behavior? Um, this business of learning, the, be the acquisition of behaviors, has a special name in behaviorism. It's called conditioning. And we're going to look at two different types. The first one, which we'll introduce, comes from Skinner. Um, it's called operant conditioning. And the underlying idea is very simple. The idea is that as you go through life, you have a lot of experiences and you're shaped by them. Because sometimes, you know what, you touch a hot plate, ow! You burn yourself, you don't want to do it again. So that's going to change the way you behave in future around hot plates. Another day you're out and you taste chocolate for the first time. You go, oh my god, I'm in love. And thereafter you're going to taste chocolate, you're going to seek out chocolate, you're going to exhibit a behavior of chocolate seeking. So the simplistic idea here is that the um, the rewards and punishments that you experience in life are the things that shape your behavior. And so this, with this simple starting point, you can design experiments to see how can we modify behavior in certain ways, how can we shape it. 
Now Skinner worked a lot with animals, and he's particularly famous for working with pigeons, who he kept in little boxes called a Skinner box. And these pigeons, note this, they were kept at about three quarters of their body weight, so they're starving little birdies. They are hungry, which means they're very motivated, which means if you give them a, a pellet of food, they're really interested. You just got their attention, right? So you keep these hungry pigeons in boxes, and in the case we're interested in today, which generated what we call the superstitious pigeons, these pigeons started behaving really, really weirdly. First of all, we have to describe the feeding schedule. Skinner set it up so that they were given food pellets at random times. Note the word random there. There's no predictability. Skinner knows that. The pigeons don't know that. Now put yourself in the mind of a pigeon, please. <laughs> okay? You've been asked to do worse. Put yourself in the mind of a pigeon, starving pigeon in a Skinner box, and you're going mental. You're, doing, you're, 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 you're walking around, you're hungry as hell, and you're tossing your head, you're flapping your wings, you're turning around. Where's the food? Where's the food? Where's the food? Bing! A pedal appears. Ta-da! You're really, really happy, first of all. And then you go, how did I, how did I do that? <laughs> right? Pigeons are no smarter than us. I think they're responsible for an awful lot of things that they're not really responsible for. So if you've just been bobbing your head, you go, okay, see, does it work again? And you keep doing it until sooner or later, because you're on a random feeding schedule, a pellet's going to appear, and the pigeon goes, I know how to do this. And so you keep bobbing your head until eventually a pellet appears. Like gamblers, pi these pigeons are notoriously bad at spotting what doesn't work, and they leap to conclusions when there's a something happens to them that they do like. Gamblers notoriously ignore all the times they lose, but they really remember those wins. So what you end up with is a bunch of crazy pigeons. This one is bobbing its head up and down. This one's turning, actually we can read um, the, a description of the actual pigeons. One bird was conditioned to turn counterclockwise around the cage, making two or three turns between reinforcements. Another one thrusting its head into the upper corner. A third one developing a tossing response. Two developed a pendulum motion of the head. What's up here? Each one has their individualized response. What's happened is you've sort of inbred a kind of a superstition into the pigeon. Please, th these are not terribly sophisticated, educated pigeons full of beliefs and theologies and superstitions and so on. But they're behaving a lot like that because each of them has the behavior it was doing before the pellet arrived has been reinforced and uh, that has become dominant. Kind of creepy. These techniques are very, very effective at shaping animal behavior. It's called behavior shaping, and it's the thing that people do when they train animals to do tricks in the circuses. This one's photoshopped. Um, you train animals to do tricks in circuses and so on, and it's very effective. It turns out that the rewards, a well-timed reward, is far more effective than any punishment regime, which is lucky, I suppose, for animals. Um, but it's not only animals in circuses who are being trained to behave in certain ways, it's all of you as well, because although, as we'll see, psychology has moved on, there are still lots of behavioral psychologists out there, and they're working for Tesco. They're working for the big supermarkets. They're working to influence your consumer behavior. When you walk into a supermarket today, that has been designed to shape your shopping habits. There are smells in the air that have been designed. The spatial location of them has been designed. Why is it that when you walk in the door, just to get the milk, you have to walk through all the aisles to get the milk at the back. It's so that you walk through all the aisles. Why do they rearrange the bloody stuff on the shelves every couple of weeks so you have to find it? So that you'll exhibit searching behavior inside the, um, the home of all the goods. So it'll lead you to buy things you didn't want to buy. So these guys are never out of work. Behaviorists are still at work, and they're working for the supermarkets. Okay, another form of conditioning we're going to meet is from Pavlov. Now, how many of you know about Pavlov's drooling dogs, or have heard about it at some stage? This is very famous work. The basic idea is this. You, give a you show a dog some food, and he'll drool, salivate. Every year when I'm grading papers in this course, I hear that dogs have been sa saved. Their souls have been saved, because they talk about the salvation of dogs. Right? Salivation means drool, right? And that's what we're talking about here, not salvation, which means your soul goes to heaven. Okay, so you present the dog with food and it drools. You ring a bell, the bell doesn't mean anything to the dog. If you repeatedly pair the bell and the food, after a while an association is formed in the dog's mind, as we would say, such that at the end of the ex 
training period, if you just ring the bell, lo and behold, the dog drools. Why is that so important? Well, we've got an unconditioned response. So you start off with some kind of built-in response. And after a while, you've got a different, a conditioned response. That's the drooling to the sound of the bell. So the sound of the bell has now become meaningful. And it's become meaningful by paired association. And that is very much like, uh, well, it provides a framework for thinking about how human worlds work, because we use a lot of things that are not intrinsically meaningful, like the words we use. If I say horse and you don't speak English, that bears no relation to a horse. It only bears a relation to a horse because we are language users who all sort of agree how to use that. So we're very good at giving meaning to things that are not intrinsically meaningful, an act of symbolization, as we will. Notice the language that's been used here of stimulus and response. The idea is that the sound of the bell is a stimulus which evokes the response, which is the drooling. And here's a picture of Senor Pavlov in his lab. Nice to see women involved in the game as well. They don't sport beards, but they do dress differently. And there's one of his actual dogs that's used. Pavlov got the Nobel Prize for this, but there is a problem with this. And I'm going to let Heinz von Furster tell the story. I think he does a rather good job of this. He tells us first about Pavlov and then about a replication. Pay attention to the replication. I think the most beautiful thing is the Pavlov side, which I think the condition reflects this goal. Huh? We have a ball. The point is a very, very good one. Pavlov was interpreting things in one way. The dog didn't share his view. The dog had the experience all the time of him brought into the room, there's the assistant, there's the window. These, a whole lot of stuff was repeating. The sound of the bell was just one part of that flow. Um, but Pavlov had decided that this was going to be the one thing that was effective on the dog. Konorsky demonstrated that the sound was irrelevant. So I think his point that the sound of the bell was a stimulus for Pavlov is very, very well taken. It shows that the way that the experimenter interprets what's going on hugely is, is, is very, very subjective. And what seems to be a property of the world can instead be a property of your own biases going in there. Unfortunately, as we said, Konorsky didn't get the Nobel Prize and Pavlov did. That's a very good question. Uh, the chances are that um, we're focusing too much on the bell itself because the assistant, the white coat, the dog being moved from its cage into the laboratory, the position of the window. So the detail in Pavlov's notebooks are going to be really important in all this. I suspect that, that, that everything matters 
so to speak. And you could probably vary lots of different bits of it. Another question you could ask is, if you didn't have all the rigmarole and you just had the sound of the bell, but it's very difficult to organize that as well. So it's a great question. I don't know the answer. <laughs> now, this approach in which we view ourselves as being kind of puppets driven by stimuli and producing responses is a very mechanical view. It suggests that we are more or less like puppets. And we'll be criti critiquing a puppet view of human nature later in this course as well. The behaviorist agenda simply didn't address a lot of the concerns that early psychologists wanted to address. It didn't go near the notion of experience. By simply ignoring the, the notion of mind, saying not mind is not scientifically valid, it's not a kind of thing we can look into, it, deny, it, it, it fails to address issues we have. We want to know how do we come to feel, how do we come to believe, how do we come to perceive. What is all that about? The theory of learning was, as we'll see, somewhat impoverished. Um, but this is the, the big thing. It had really nothing to say about experience. And so there was a sea change around about the middle of the 20th century, something that we're going to meet repeatedly. There was a huge change in the way that we started to think, psychologists started to think, about minds, brains, and behavior. And this will be known as the cognitive turn. Um, we can identify a very important exchange that happened around this time between Skinner up here, who is very interested in how your behavior is, is modified by experience, so he's kind of emphasizing empirical concerns there. He wrote a book on how we learn language. Now that's moving well out of the domain of these crazy pigeons. His book appropriately isn't called Language, it's called Verbal Behavior. That's a Skinnerian view of what language is. And he basically said that to speak English is to have a set of behaviors that allow you to respond appropriately during an English conversation. His book was subject to a withering critique by a young academic at the time known as, anyone know this? Chomsky, Noam, Noam Chomsky was a young linguist in MIT who wrote a scathing review of this, pointing out some rather obvious facts. Skinner's view seems to rely on a lot of repetition and habit formation. And Chomsky pointed out that one of the most essential characteristics of language is that sentences are creative. If we're engaged in any kind of reasonably sophisticated language use, the sentence that's being uttered, including this sentence right now, has never before been uttered in the entire history of humankind. Well, maybe that one has been, because I teach this course a lot, and I say more or less the same thing a lot. But you see what I mean? You never heard that sentence before. And I probably never said it in exactly that way. So an account that's built on repetition and invariance is not going to work when it comes to language, because language is creative. It's not parroted, which I think doesn't insult the parrots, who are very good at not parroting. But anyway, let's move on to Chomsky, who was part of a one central figure in this big change that happened around the middle of the 20th century, the cognitive revolution. He was a linguist, so he's, he's working mainly in the domain of language. Um, if Skinner was very interested in how experience comes to shape your belief, Chomsky emphasizes rationalist concerns. He's very, his, his view of language forced him to a point where he, had to, he said, look, what these kids are learning, they're not just learning by experience. Because he looked, he considered the kind of language that infants hear. Oh, look at the little fella, he's got his mother's nose. It's not great as a textbook for learning language. It doesn't contain negative examples, it's, uh, it's crap. People talk weird to infants. Um, and furthermore, you all know how hard it is to learn a language at your high old age, but under the right conditions at the right age, Kids just learn language just like it's a natural, like, like a flower blooms. You know, it's just real, real easy. Every kid does it. And they do it in a remarkably short period of time. So he figured they've got to be, they've got to have a built-in mechanism ready to go for this. So it was, they're born with an innate readiness to use language, a classic rationalist kind of concern here. And he described this knowledge, not of English or of Chinese, but of language generally as a form of universal grammar. If this is built in and you, you sort of, you come with knowledge of what language is and so you only have to learn, well, what, what are the details that make it English rather than Chinese, that hugely reduces the role of experience in your account of what's learned. So that's interesting and we'll come back to language because language played a hugely 
important role in this cognitive revolution and in the form of psychology that came thereafter, cognitive psychology. Another figure who played a big role in this is Jerry Fodor. He's a philosopher who worked together with, Clo with Chomsky, and he took Chomsky's theories of language and he sort of worked them into a theory of mind based on the new metaphor that was available, the metaphor of the computer, the notion of minds as being a form of information processing, and the activity of the brain as being a form of computation. This was a language that wasn't available before. Information theory had been born in the 1940s in Bell Labs. Digital computers had only just arrived on the scene. So this is a whole new language in which to consider what's going on. In this first book, we're going to consider the modularity of mind. He tried to describe mind brains. I think he thinks of them as very, very similar. There's almost the same thing. Like a, 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 a software ecosystem in which there's lots of specialized apps, you might say, or modules, which are responsible for different things. So the bit of the mind that's responsible for speaking doesn't know how to see, and the bit of the mind that's responsible for planning doesn't know, doesn't know anything much about color. And the idea is, if you've got a smartphone, you've got a lot of apps. The one that's responsible for telling you the time of the next bus is very different from the one that's responsible for downloading podcasts. So you keep them separate, and that way you end up with these small little encapsulated functions. So domain specificity and information encapsulation, these are the kind of jargon that emerges here in this theory, because he's thinking of what's going on in the brain as if it's a major software environment with lots of programs running. He wrote a second book, a little later, called The Language of Thought, and that places these kinds of linguistic thoughts right at the heart of the philosophy of mind. He thought that thought itself is structured much like language. Now, let's, what, does, what would that even mean? We all know that sometimes when we think, it's a bit like talking to ourselves. You sort of, inside your head, you go, hmm, should I go to the shop and get butter? That kind of thing. We're all capable of talking to ourselves. And some of what you want to capture by the word thought undoubtedly is of this nature is language-like. And that's where Jerry Fodor says, well, look, that's thinking, so that your thought, I would like a pie, has a structure to it, much like the structure of the sentence, I would like a pie. And in linguistics, the structure of sentences is where all the action is at at this stage. This kicked off a huge, big discussion we'll come to at different stages in this course, um, because there's a lot of senses of the word thinking that maybe aren't covered by this. So if you imagine a beautiful field on a sunny day, that's kind of more pictorial, isn't it? It's more like seeing something rather than speaking something. And maybe you want to include in thought that vague sense of unease you have as you suspect someone sneaking up behind you with a knife. Um, so the word thought is poorly defined, like the word mind. It's one of those things we constantly have to work on. But here's Jerry Fodor coming along and making a move and saying, well, we can discipline some of this within a, a new kind of theory of mind, which he calls a computational theory of mind. It's a new vocabulary, and it ushers in a whole new way of thinking about the business of psychology. Here's Jerry Fodor, and I want to read this quote in two ways. First of all, we'll see the computational theory of mind is, in my view, by far the best theory of cognition that we've got. Indeed, the only one we've got that's worth the bother of serious discussion. Its central idea, blah, 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 is strikingly elegant. Forget the central idea, just listen to the language. How arrogant is this? This is a hallmark of much of the argumentation done in this day. Chomsky argues in similar vein, similarly arrogant, from a high horse, dismissing all other theories. But somehow this became the language of the computational theory of mind. And this is from 2001. Very, very unhelpful. However, it's also very influential, so we have to engage with it. Let's have a look at that blah, 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 then, shall we? Whatever his central idea is that so ex exercises Jerry Fodor's imagination. That intentional processes are syntactic operations defined on mental representations. Janie Mac, what does that mean? Let's have a look at it. Intentional processes, right. Intentionality is something that greatly exercises the minds of these guys. When we have a thought, the thought is very often about something, just as a sentence is very often about something. You can think about a giraffe 
even though the giraffe is not present. You can also speak about a giraffe even though the giraffe is not present. So thought and language seem to have this property of being about things. Now, nothing else in the entire known universe is about anything else. The sun is not about Jupiter. Copper is not about lead. In the, in the domain of the natural sciences, you never, ever use this word about. But when it comes to thought and language, we seem to be stuck with it. That's called intentionality, and it's something that this theory of mind sets out to make sense of. Then we've got syntactic operations. Now, syntax, as we'll see, is one of the properties of language. In language, in order to make a sentence, you take a load of symbols, words, and you put them into a sequence, a sentence, and if you put them in the wrong order, they don't make sense. So there's rules governing what the order is of these, sequ of these symbols, and there's rules governing transformations of these orders. So I can say, for example, um, I kicked the ball yesterday, and I can also say the ball was kicked by me yesterday. That's a rule-based reordering that preserves some elements of meaning. That syntactic view of language comes from Chomsky's work, who made syntax his central pillar. And he had worked previously on formal languages, that is, computer languages. Those of you who've learned to program computers know something about C or Java or something like this. This, this is not natural language. It's not language like English. But there's some aspects that they have in common. And in particular, the that they have, you can posit a set of rules that determine which sequences of symbols are going to be allowed and will be effective. They have that in common. So his idea here is that the processes of thought, whatever they are, that manage to be about something, are syntactic in much the way that the words of a language are syntactic. And he says they're defined on mental representations. That's the last term here. And let's have a look at that. Well, we're, mental representation is a topic we're going to come back to. We're going to have a whole lecture or two devoted to it. For now, however, if we suddenly start to think of minds as if they were computers, then the mental representations are more or less the data on which the program works. So different programs work using different data. If you have an app that tells you what time the next bus is at, bus times are data for that one. If you're using Microsoft Word, then the text you write is data there, among other things. So this is the central idea that everything's like language and it's all also like what goes on inside a computer. That's more or less the, a translation of this. Obviously, we're not doing it justice here. But um, we'll be unpacking this a little bit as we go along. So what we've seen now, we've traced out a, um, a bunch of periods within the development of the young science of psychology. At the beginning, we've got this crazy mishmash, all kinds of things going on, influenced by lots of different sciences, and nobody's in charge, of course. Then we get um, some schools getting a bad name for themselves by using bad scientific methods like introspection. So we get this hard-nosed set of people like behaviorists who adopt a very rigid approach to how to understand behavior, work mainly with animals, and are, while they're hugely effective at coming up with techniques for shaping behavior, they don't really reveal anything about the, the mind that we really wanted to find out. And then in the middle of the 20th century, we've got this cognitive turn where the language of computers, the language of symbol processing, the language of information processing all becomes available, and it changes the way these guys think. And at the heart of this turn is the role of language and the way that language is understood. Now, we'll be revisiting this. We've got a little ways to go yet in this topic, but the next topic we're going to pick up, and we'll start it the next day, is language, because language has played such a central role, but only since about 1950 in how we understand the mind. Okay, we're going to take a break there, leave it there, and we'll pick up the story on Thursday. <laughs>